Good morning. Good to see each of you this morning. Let's stand together and sing Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. It's number 26 in your hymn books. Number 26. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw that song, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation. So um, springtime is a wonderful testimony of all of God's creation. What have you noticed in your life this spring that gives praise to God? Just real quickly, just tulips, tulips okay? Bluebells. Bluebells. Calves, all right? We don't want to bring that up. I, I had, have two calves that are ready for weaning, and we thought, Andrew said, I've got grass, why don't you bring them over here? So I loaded them up yesterday and took them over there, and you learn a lot of things the hard ways, okay? They have been chasing calves all over the county because they want to find their mama. And some of you farmers are saying, you idiot, you should have known better than that. You're right, I am an idiot, all right? Um, and uh, so calves, uh, it's, it's great to see life and young life, and there's nothing neater than a calf unless you're chasing it to get it in, <laughs> running and kicking its heels and, and that. So, um, all right, what else? Pardon? Cats? <laughs> Amen. I am, I am glad people love cats. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Anything else? Sunshine. All right. Well, let's bow together in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are the king of creation. And Lord, our soul praises you for that, but we also praise you even more so for our salvation. And Lord, without that, 
everything else would be meaningless. And we praise you today that we can be brought to a relationship with you through faith in Jesus Christ. So Lord, thank you that you sought us out, that you paid the penalty for our sin, and that you continue to work in our lives to mold us to your image. Lord, we rejoice in who you are today, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It is such a blessing to be able to have our faith in Jesus Christ as the solid rock that we can stand on. I mean, everything else in this world is so shifting and changing, but rejoice that we have Jesus Christ. Let's sing number 411, the solid rock, number 411. My sing the song, I'd Rather Have Jesus. It's number 454 in your hymn books. 454, I'd Rather Have Jesus. is 
invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians 4. And while you're turning there, I, I want you to pause and give thanks to God that you have access to the Bible. I mean, we take it so for granted because we have such great access to it, but I mean, the Bible is a miracle that, that you're holding in your hands. I mean, it, is, it has been vilified and attacked and people have committed to doing away with the Bible and it has stood all the ages and it is true and that we have the opportunity to have the Bible uh, electronically or in print I mean, it's something many people around the world would give anything to have, and uh, what a rich privilege. So in your heart, just thank God that we, we have this. Ephesians chapter 4, I'll begin reading in verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. <clears throat> Let's sing the song, You Are My All in All. We'll have the words for you on the overhead. You are my all in all. my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are 
song a passion for thee it's number 371 why don't we stand together as we sing a passion for thee number 371 in your hymn books set my heart oh dear father on thee and the old give me a thirst for thy presence divine seated invite you to turn again to Ephesians chapter 4 <clears throat> as we mentioned last week as we're going through the book of Ephesians the first three chapters he really opens up and and presents a defense of of our salvation the doctrinal basis of of our salvation and what God has done for us, it is all of God and not of us. We have nothing that we can glory in. And that he's brought us into his family. That um, he is making us a part of his um, temple, as he said in, in those chapters. But he laid the doctrinal basis. And then beginning in chapter 4, he's bringing it down to here's the application. Here's how it should, should work out of your life. And in the passage that, that we read, he, he's showing the stark contrast. If we have genuine faith in our lives, 
it, it will be manifested. It will, it will be a, a natural thing. It will, um, it doesn't just happen. Uh, there is a battle, and he, he alludes to that throughout this. And, and yet, God has done his part, and we have a responsibility, not in our salvation, but he's saying, if there is genuine salvation, there should be some things that take place in our life that are clearly evident. And so we want to look today at some of these things that he mentions that true faith, and there are many people, and Jesus said, many will say to me, Lord, we did all these wonderful works in your name, in your name cast out devils, and he will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. There are many people that, that say they're going to heaven, that say they have faith. But genuine faith will be evident, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, by their fruits you shall know them. What comes out of their life? It will be evident in, in what is really in the heart. Has there been the working of God take place in our heart? So, right away in this passage that we're at, Paul is telling us true faith brings change. You notice he said, you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. In other words, he's saying, no longer, I mean, if you're truly a follower of Christ, if you've trusted him for the forgiveness of sins, there should be a change. You should no longer be walking as those that are unbelievers. Um, someone paraphrased these verses in this way, and I thought it, it made it personal. Live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Okay, so why would you live like them? They are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. And Paul says, but this isn't what you learned in Christ Jesus. So really, Paul is trying to show the stark contrast. This is what the natural man, without Christ, this is how they live. They've, they've hardened their hearts, rejecting God. They've alienated themselves from the life that is in God. We don't need that. We don't want that. They, they are hopelessly confused. If you don't understand that, if you, if you question that, look at our society today, how confused our society is today. They are full of darkness, no sense of shame, they lived in lustful pleasure, practice every kind of impurity. And Paul's saying, hey, Christ didn't come to bring salvation to you and leave you living this same way. No, he came to bring a change. He came to change us from darkness to light, from hopelessness to having a definite purpose in life, from, from death to life. We're not alienated from the life of God, from impurity to purity. And, and Paul is showing to these believers at Ephesus that why would you want to go back to this? This is like, like going back to a rotten corpse. It's, it's like uh, going back to that which is decaying and, and stinking and getting worse all the time. And if you want to go back and put on that garment, something's wrong, he's saying. See, ordinary religion will put a thin layer of veneer over the natural man to try to make it 
look good. It, it may even take some severe steps to make it look good, that you need to do this and this and this, and they may be good things, but it's never changed the heart. And, and because of that, the old man is alive and well. The old nature is alive and well. Christ didn't come to touch up and, and do a, a makeover of our old nature. He came to put it to death and to give us new life. And that's why Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. God is creating a, a new man in Christ. Old things are passing away. Behold, all things have become new. It is impossible to have Christ dwelling in you and remain the same. It is impossible. True faith brings change. True faith, secondly, as we, we look at this passage, true faith shows up in everyday life. See, we think of, of faith, we think of, uh, many people think of faith and think of religion. It's, it's what you do when you, you read the Bible at home alone. It's what you do when you come to church. It's what you do when you pray or whatever you do. People go to the synagogue or go to their temple or whatever it is. And, and they think that's faith. Jesus Christ's life in his earthly ministry was continually striking out at that image of religion or that image of faith that limits it to just these, these certain practices that religion does. And he said, if you have genuine faith, it will be manifested in every area of your life. Christianity is the most practical philosophy, belief, because it affects every area of our life. Proper Christianity. There's not an, there's not an area of our life that is to be untouched by it. And, and it's, it's in our relationship with God. And Christianity, the first place that it will show up is in our relationships. And he's dealing with here in Ephesians 4. And he goes in and, and beginning at verse 25, he gives illustrations that we'll look at here in just a moment. But they all deal with relationships with people. I mean, he's, he's telling us if Christ is in you, it will affect how you relate to others, beginning in your own home and then beginning in your relationship with other believers and your relationship with people that are apart from Christ. Christ in our life will show up in everyday aspects of everything that we do. C.S. Lewis said, when we Christians behave badly or fail to behave well, we are making Christianity unbelievable to the outside world. See, we, we sometimes pray, God, help me to be a witness for you. And sometimes we're thinking, give me an opportunity to share the gospel with someone and Lord, I'd really love it if they trusted Christ as their Savior. And, and we ought to do that, of course. But you are a witness every day, every moment, either a good witness of God or a poor witness of God. And our lives, as we've said before, as, as the world gets darker and darker, it shouldn't be, it doesn't take that much to stand out. I mean, as, as he's going to, we'll look at it here in just a moment. 
He's going to list areas. And, and this is norm for the world. It's norm for the world to be dishonest. He says, if Christ is in you, you'll be honest. And it will show up in every aspect of our life. When, when it does not show up in every aspect of our life, then we are failing to be the witness. We are failing to be representatives. He says we are ambassadors, representatives of God. When it doesn't show up, then we're failing in the responsibilities God gives us. And as we've said over and over again, the light that shines the farthest shines the brightest at home. It ought to show up first and foremost in our behavior in our home. I mean, anybody can act like a Christian here in church. You all look like wonderful Christians today. I mean, you're, you're not spouting words of anger. You're not glaring at people. You're not robbing something from your neighbor's purse there. I mean, you're, you look, it's, it's easy to be a Christian here. But it's when things aren't going well, then that's where the life of Christ should really come out of our life. It's, it's then that there should be a difference made. So true life, true faith will show up in everyday life. True faith practices the principle of replacement. You'll notice he says here, beginning in verse 20, but ye have not so learned Christ. He, we've already looked at the previous verses. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed, so you put off this, and you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. It is a simple principle of replacement. You put off the old way of life, and you put on... The new way of life. It's, it's a terminology that, that is used in, like with garments. So he says, the old way of life, you put that off. You, you, you have received in Christ the new life. Don't keep letting the old way of life ruin you. I really like this illustration. I wasn't planning it, but I'm hot. So I'm putting off the old way of life, all right? So we put off the old way of life. But we, we sometimes think that the Christian life is don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And many times we're raised that way. No, you're a Christian. Don't do that and don't do that and don't do That's putting off. But we need to replace it by putting on. Put on the power of the Spirit. And, and so he begins, and, and we're going to go through some of these. Therefore, verse 25, therefore, putting away lying. So my, my old nature is lying. All of us are liars. We're born liars. No one ever had to sit down and teach their child how to lie. And, and, and to some parents, when their little angel tells the first lie, where did they get that? <laughs> Go look in the mirror. That's where they got it, all right? Who taught them how to be deceived? It's in their nature. I mean, even before you caught on, they were crying and carrying on like they were hungry. And they weren't. They just wanted you to pick them up. They were deceiving you right from the very start. That's our old way of life. Our old way of life is manipulating 
and lying and avoiding the truth and telling partial truth. He said, that, that's the way the old way of life is. You now have a new master. He says, I want you to put on honesty. I want you to be honest. What a stark contrast that would be in our world today, right? And he says, this is how we show the difference. He goes on and he says, um, verse 26, Be ye angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. So you put off anger. Anger is energy. I mean, when, when you get angry, you have energy. You're, we say the blood is boiling, okay? Or you see it in, in a person's eyes, all right? There's, there's energy. Anger in and of itself, the energy in and of itself is not evil. It's what you do with that energy. If with the energy that you have, you end up dealing with the problem in a, in a good manner that honors God, that's using the energy. You can have anger and not sin, meaning you're using the energy. But when that energy makes you slam doors, stomp out of a room, say things in the heat of the matter or all the other things that we naturally do, then we're sinning. So he says, as a Christian now, you're used to having anger and, and you're used to doing all these things that, that you know, kicking a door or kicking a dog or, or whatever, you know, you're angry, throwing down a tool and, and all these things, okay? He says, no, put that away. Now use your energy and, and respond properly. And, and really, the bottom line, usually we're angry because circumstances don't go our way or because people don't do what we like them to do or they violate what we think they're not respecting us and so on. He says, rather than anger, he says, and he goes on later, not later on, he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. All of those are the clusters of anger with all malice. And then what does he say? I want you to be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. So there's a definite difference when we're in Christ and he's controlling our life. Then there's a definite difference how we respond. He says, let him that stole steal no more. Selfishness, stealing. Um, the, the reality of I see something I want, I'm going to take it. It's selfishness. We often then quote the next part. Let him that stole give up, put off stealing, and let him work with his hands for what purpose? That he may have to give to him that needeth. The root cause of selfishness is sin. I mean, the root cause of stealing is selfishness, which is sin. But you know what? We can work very hard and still have selfishness. But when we work and, and have an attitude of God, however you want me to use this, if you want me to give here, then I'm willing to give. So the old way of, not, of life is getting for myself. And even if it means stealing. But the new life under the new master, under Jesus Christ, is, no, I'm going to be responsible, I'm going to work, and I'm going to be committed to being generous in all that I do and have. Then he says, 
Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Verse 29. So put away belittling, I can hardly say it, okay? Speech that belittles others, all right? Where you're putting down. Let all corrupt communication be put away from you. Gossip, dishonesty, slander, um, evil speaking. Let, let all of that be put away from you and, and speak that which is good to building up edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. So we put away the speech that tears down. The speech that, that hurts, the speech that wounds. And rather, we bring speech that builds them up, that ministers grace. <clears throat> grace is the desire to do God's will. God gives us grace, the desire to do his will. So it ministers grace. It, it builds up and, and, and strengthens and encourages so he says, if you have genuine faith, it's going to become less and less this speech that attacks others, that paints a bad picture of others, uh, uh, gossip, slander, evil speaking, let alone uh, filthy talking that comes out of our mouth. We put that away, <clears throat> and now we put on what Christ wants us to speak. So, again, in our homes, this is where it, it shows up. Then he goes on and he says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. He's saying, put away viciousness. I mean, all these things are wrath and anger and clamor. It's... It's all attacking, it's all vicious, it's putting down. And, and thinking by putting someone down, it's raising us up. He says, no, put that away from you and replace it with kindness. Overcome evil with good. So this is the put off, okay? It's not just put off, but it's put off and put on. Okay, I'm, I'm going to try. I'm going to try today to to not speak evil of someone. It's not just not speaking evil. It's speaking good of people. It's encouraging because if you don't replace it, it creates a vacuum. You'll be drawn right back into it, and this is why throughout. Throughout the New Testament and especially Paul's writings, he's continually saying, put off and put on. Put off and put on. And he lists these things and he says, if, if you are genuine, genuinely a child of God, you will, you will do this. And some of you may be sitting here today and thinking, ay, 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 all these things that, that we're supposed to do, how do I remember them all? Let, let me just wrap it up as Paul wraps it up. In verse 30, he says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. True faith aims to not grieve the Spirit of God. And if your aim, this is, this is making it as simple, as easy to understand as possible. You don't really need to remember all those other things if you are committed to obeying the Spirit of God. He'll be the one that says, oh, 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 zip your lip there. You were about ready to say something that wouldn't have been good. And the Spirit of God will tell us, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. He says, grieve not the Spirit of God. <clears throat> to a believer, there, there are three, three sins, basically, that we can commit against God's Spirit. 
We can quench the Spirit of God. That is in the sense of, of suppressing a fire. You pour water on it, you douse it, you cover it. We can quench the Spirit. To a believer, every believer has the Spirit of God dwelling within him. <clears throat> we can quench the Spirit by ignoring him, um, not inviting him to be a part of our life, although he lives within us. We're, we're running our own life. We're not, we're not seeking his advice. We're not seeking his power. We're not seeking his strength. We're not seeking his counsel. We're running our own life. We're, we have the MVP of all the ages, but we sit him on the bench and don't even get him in the game. That's quenching the spirit. We can resist the spirit, and, and the spirit is convicting us, and we resist it. We um, aggressively or intentionally, no, I am not going to do that. And, and the angel said to Saul, it is hard for you to kick against the goads of the spirit. You know, the Spirit of God does not make us obey Him. He may goad us, and we have every privilege to kick against it. It's only going to hurt us. We can resist the Spirit, and then there are times that we grieve the Spirit. Um, <clears throat> there, there are times, Andrew and I... Um, coach the high school girls soccer team there are times that we've told them in practice or even right before a game something to do some simple little thing okay simple little thing if Zeke and I are on the same team and the ball is here and and we're going this way and the ball is right evenly between us I should get out of the way and let him go with it. So, I mean, that'd be easier than me coming over here, turning the ball around and get going. So we say, we, we do that. We're not five minutes into the game, and what happens? I got it, I got it, Zeke, you go away. And, and we're here turning around. And Andrew and I will look at each other and go, oh boy. We're grieved. That, that is a very low level because, you know what? Girls' soccer doesn't matter. Boys' soccer doesn't matter. None of it matters. But when the Holy Spirit has told us something and he sees us disobey it, I just, I just picture the Holy Spirit. Oh, why? Because he knows there will be adverse consequences to it. He, he's, he's never like a doctor and says, well, let's try this. Doctors are fallible just like counselors. Counselors can say, well, let's try this. The Holy Spirit never says, let's try this. The Holy Spirit knows exactly what we are to do. And... Every time we disobey the Spirit, He is grieved. And He is burdened. The grieve to, means to make sorrowful, to make sad. It means we cause the Spirit of God sorrow and pain and distress. See, not only is He grieved when, when we disobey His will... He's really grieved when we say the Spirit led me to do this and it is contrary to the Word of God. There are many people that say the Spirit led me to do this. Wait a minute, that, that's completely contrary to what the Spirit wrote down and recorded for all these ages. And, and so the Spirit would really be grieved <clears throat> When we are attributing to him something that contradicts, 
the word of God who the Holy Spirit is the author of. So this put off and put on, don't let it, don't let it overwhelm you. If, you, if we would get this in our hearts and minds, I do not want to grieve the Spirit of God. And if I said this, would it grieve the Spirit of God? If I did this, would it grieve the Spirit of God? If I neglect this, would it grieve the Spirit of God? He grieves over us because he sees how much chastisement, discipline we will incur, occur and because of the communion, the fellowship that we lose. And he's grieved over that. And, and if we would really come to grips with this, God, I do not want to grieve your spirit. I mean, this is very similar to, to walking in the fear of the Lord. God, I, I want your spirit to be Wow, look at that. Look at that decision they made. There's also times when Andrew and I look at each other and say, Wow, look at, they're, they're growing. They developed. They're, they did what, they, what they're being coached to do. That's a great thing. That's what I want the Holy Spirit to look at in my life and say. Charles Spurgeon said, Grieving the Spirit produces a lamentable result. In the child of God, it will not lead to his utter destruction, for no heir of heaven can perish. Neither will the Holy Spirit be utterly taken away from him, for the Spirit of God is given to abide in us forever. But the ill effects are nevertheless most terrible. You will lose all sense of the Spirit's presence. He will be as one hidden from you. Listen to this. No beams of comfort, no words of peace, no thoughts of love. There will be what the author Spurgeon said, Cowper calls, an aching void the world can never fill. He goes on, grieve the Holy Spirit and you will lose all Christian joy. The light shall be taken from you and you shall stumble in darkness. Those very means of grace which were once such a delight shall have no music in your ear. Your soul shall be no longer as a watered garden, but as a howling wilderness. Grieve the Spirit of God, you will lose all power. If you pray, it will be a very weak prayer. If you, you will not prevail with God. When you read the Scriptures, you shall not be able to lift the latch and force your way into the inner mysteries of truth. When you go to the house of God, there shall be none of that devout exhilaration, that running without weariness, that walking without feigning. You will feel like Samson when his hair was lost, weak, captive, and blinded. Let the Holy Spirit be grieved and assurance is gone. Doubts follow, questioning and suspicions arouse. Grieve the Spirit of God and usefulness will cease. The ministry shall yield no fruit. Your Sunday school work shall be barren. Your speaking to others and laboring for others shall be like sowing to the wind. You know, I, we pray for revival. And sometimes we pray for it like it's something that, that it is. God is responsible for it. But we need to make sure we're lined up with the Spirit of God. And I believe every one of us need to come back and say, God, I come and, and seek your forgiveness for grieving your Spirit. My attitude, my, my actions, my speech... God, I've grieved your Spirit in, in just... I'm living my own life. I sit down and read the Bible and it's on my own. I'm not even dependent on your spirit. We think, well, yeah, I know the spirit of... You know, we ought to be saying, God, I want your spirit to open the eyes of my understanding. I can't understand this. And I believe we have... I mean, what I read, what Spurgeon says, that describes Christianity today. 
And I believe we have so grieved the Spirit of God that, that He is. He says, here you go. I've been quenched. I've been resisted. I'm grieved. And now we bear the consequences. And I believe there needs to be in every one of our hearts of coming back and saying, God. And, and you know what? As we do, the Spirit of God will specifically lead us in areas and show us, right, boy, what I said there grieved your spirit. I mean, I was going to say, I'd like to see a video of the Spirit in my life. I think it'd be a, it'd be a sad video of 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 our thoughts, that, right even in our own homes, some of the thoughts that we have toward each other and, and the things we say. And I, I think the, the Spirit of God, if we looked over, he'd be like, oh my goodness. I mean, if we really came to grips with this, all, all the other things that Paul said, the Spirit of God would be saying, would be bringing it to our reality. And, and I personally believe we need to come back and, and say before God, God, please forgive me for grieving your spirit. And because of that, we don't have the power, we don't have the strength, we don't have the comfort, we don't have the direction. And then to say, God, would you change my heart? Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we plead your mercies. God, I personally plead your mercies for my life. And God, I, I seek your forgiveness for over and over grieving your spirit. And I pray in my life and in each of our lives there'd be a renewed sensitivity to your spirit. And Lord, that we would live to bring joy to your spirit and not grieve your spirit. Lord, I pray if there are individuals here who have never called upon you for the forgiveness of sins, your spirit is not dwelling within them, I pray today they would call upon you to forgive their sins and you said the moment we do that, your spirit would take up permanent residence in our life to lead, to empower, to comfort, to direct. Lord, I pray that you would find in us broken and contrite hearts for the offenses that we've brought to your spirit who you graciously and generously have given fully to every one of us. Lord, please do a work in our hearts that would please you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's